Like it or not, traveling through time is something we all do. Except for all of us here on Earth, we only go forward. We've never figured out a way to go backwards in time. But is that actually forbidden? Or, if we were clever enough and manipulated the laws of physics in the right way, would it be possible after all? Find out on this edition of the Starts With a Bang podcast. Here on Earth, time passes at the most boring rate possible. One second per second. That's the rate that time passes. And it passes at that rate for us because almost all of our motion is through time rather than through space. This was one of the fundamental lessons that we learned from Einstein's theory of relativity. That if you want to move faster and faster through time, what you should do is slow down your motion through space. We also learned that the converse is true. The faster you move through space, the slower your motion through time is. You can envision this by thinking about a light clock. Imagine that I have two mirrors and I'm bouncing a photon between them. And I have them set up so that if I bounce one from the bottom up to the top mirror, Back down to the bottom, that takes one second if I'm at rest. Then what I can do is I can imagine what happens if I put my light clock on a very quickly moving train or plane and it moves to the side. That photon at the bottom of the light clock is going to move diagonally, hit the top, and move down over here. Compared to someone at rest, whose light clock just moves up and down, this light clock will look like it does this. Or will it? It can't, because the speed of light has to be a constant. So if this is moving with a certain speed, then this has to move with the same speed, which means it'll take longer to make that complete motion. So, to someone here on Earth, stationary with our own light clock, someone moving very quickly, it'll appear to us like time is moving slower for them. This is the origin of the twin paradox in special relativity. Hi, I'm Ethan's twin. I'm going to get on a rocket ship, and I'm going to travel 40 light years in this direction to a new star and I'm going to go extraordinarily close to the speed of light. Thanks to the power of relativity, the distance between me and this distant star is going to be contracted so that it's barely under one light year. And if I move close to the speed of light, I'm only going to experience a journey of one year as I make it to that star. And then I'll turn around and come back home to Earth. And back here on Earth, I'm the original Ethan. Forget that twin guy. Don't trust him. I'm staying right here. But what I see is that spaceship that my twin is on is traveling close to the speed of light, but it takes him 41 years. 40 years because that's the journey at light speed, plus the one year because he can't quite move at the speed of light to get to that star. And then another 41 years to come back. If I'm still around when he gets back, I'll be 82 years older, even though my twin will have aged only two years. Future Ethan, who goes out and comes back, that version will be just 41 and a half years old. But if I'm still around here on Earth, I'll be 121, making me the oldest human ever to live. But that's not traveling back in time. That's traveling forward as slowly as possible. What if I actually wanted to try and travel back in time? Well, you cannot do that in special relativity. But in general relativity, when you fold in the curvature of space itself, you're not just limited by your motion through space and your motion through time. Because, in general relativity, the fabric of space can be curved, can distort, 
And if I curve it enough, I can have two different patches of space connect to each other, forming what we know as a wormhole. It is actually possible to cheat time a little bit. The first solution that talked about potentially traveling back in time in the context of general relativity came about in the 1930s when they realized that if you could take an axially symmetric rotating space-time full of dust, it exhibits a weird property that we call closed time-like curves. Now, we're used to, here on Earth, closed space-like curves, where if you travel in one direction long enough, like, for instance, around the equator of our planet, you could come back to your starting point, but you'll do it at a later moment in time. That's a closed space-like curve. In a closed time-like curve, you can come back to the same location in both space and time as where you started. In other words, I could be right here right now, and if I could find a way to make a closed time-like curve, then I can go off on a journey and come back and meet the original version of myself after I've aged and gone on a journey. A closed time-like loop is literally going out, doing something, coming back to your original location in time. Now, many of the solutions that found closed time-like curves turn out to not be very physically interesting. Uh, for example, the Godel universe postulates that if I have a universe like ours, that's an expanding universe like ours with a cosmological constant, which is what dark energy appears to be, but that also rotates with a very particular speed, I could come back to my same initial location. That universe exhibits closed time-like curves. However, our universe isn't rotating, or I should rather say, if our universe is rotating, it does so with a speed, with a rotational speed, an angular velocity that's far below the limit of what the Godel universe needs to have closed time-like curves. We also have black holes in our universe. We have non-rotating black holes, which are known as Schwarzschild black holes, and we have rotating black holes that spin about an axis. Those are known as Kerr black holes. Now, the Kerr solution to Einstein's equations to general relativity exhibits closed time-like curves, very close to the singularity inside the event horizon. This isn't very helpful for us. In general, in our universe, we would like to remain outside the event horizon of a black hole for pretty obvious reasons. Bad things happen to you when you go inside, and also, you never really get out to enjoy the experiences of traveling back in time. It wasn't until John Wheeler in the 1960s and 1970s started thinking about the ideas of a wormhole, that time travel back in time would start to become a physical possibility for our universe. What Wheeler noticed is, at a quantum level, you have these tiny fluctuations in the fabric of space itself. And these fluctuations don't just exist in space, but also in time. There's an inherent uncertainty, as though the universe itself were on a vibrating surface. And these uncertainties caused what we call quantum foam today. It causes these fluctuations in space, in time, but also in matter and energy. You've heard of particle-antiparticle pairs popping in and out of existence. You've heard about stolen energy. Well, you can have positive and negative energy fluctuations. A positive energy fluctuation could create a strong gravitational source temporarily. A strong negative fluctuation can create the opposite of that. And if these two fluctuations occur together and connect, you can have a quantum wormhole. Now, that's great if you're a virtual subatomic particle, but what if you're a human being in a spaceship that would like to traverse through a wormhole? 
Well, in the 1980s, one of John Wheeler's students, Kip Thorne, along with his students, figured out that if you put together enough mass, like a galaxy's worth of matter, and created a black hole, that's great. That's a hole in space, and boom, super massive, super large, sucks everything in, and it goes into the abyss, into the singularity at the center. But if you take the idea of a wormhole, and you take the idea that, hey, maybe there is something with negative mass or negative energy in the universe, there may yet be, we just haven't discovered it yet, but it is not forbidden by any of the laws of physics. If I have my positively massed black hole, and then the negative mass or negative energy counterpart to that, Again, tremendous amount of energy. It would have to be made out of about a galaxy's worth of anti-energy. I could connect these two and make a real traversable wormhole. Now, this is not that useful if you make them very close together, but if you start pulling them apart, what that means is I can enter at one end, instantly exit at the other end, and no time will appear to have passed along that journey. So now, we still haven't gone back in time, but let's put those things we learned about special relativity at the beginning, moving close to the speed of light, and this wormhole idea together. That's going to be the key to traveling back in time in our actual physical universe. The way you do this is you construct your wormhole, and let's say we do this in 1933. 1933, just before, say, Hitler win the election in Germany and rises to power. You create this wormhole in 1933, back when we're first working out the solutions to Einstein's equation, and all four of your grandparents, they're very young at this time, but all four of your grandparents decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to get into a spaceship with one end of this wormhole that we've created. So you make a wormhole, and your grandparents go ahead and get in on this end. So they're here at this end. And what we're going to do now is take this far end of the wormhole and take it close to the speed of light off into space. Time back here on Earth passes just as it normally would. Time back here on Earth starts going and going and going, and that's fine. But it's also going as you traverse your journey close to the speed of light. Your grandparents age and grow up and have children, including your parents. Your parents meet each other and have you. And then you have heard the prophecy about Hitler and you decide, okay, it's been long enough, I'm grown enough, and I'm ready for the challenge, I'm going to step back through the mouth of this wormhole. And you go and do that. You step back through the mouth of the wormhole, and you come out the other end. And guess what? If you're moving, and it's been, say, 80-some-odd years, and you come back, maybe only one year has passed. As fast as you've moved, that time has not passed as much here on Earth. So maybe it's only 1934. Maybe you can go back with what you know, and you can give the technology to the Allies immediately about the atomic bomb. Maybe you can sow dissent in Germany and take the Nazi regime down before it gathers power and starts World War II. Maybe you can bring other things back in time that you've discovered aboard your ship. You can't go back to before the time that you left and you pulled these wormholes apart, but you can go back in time relative to what you've lived. This is the closest we figured out within our actual constraints of the physical universe to traveling backwards in time. It may be impractical, and it may not be possible at all if negative mass or negative energy is not something that physically exists. But if it is, then travel back in time will be possible after all. The Starts With a Bang podcast is only made possible through the generous donations of our Patreon supporters. So I'd like to thank everyone donating at the $5 a month level and above. Shoutouts go to... 
Samir Kumar, Ryan Schultz, Bakhtiar, Chris Shaw, Thomas Sola, Robert J. Hansen, Denier, Igor Mitrofanov, Elver Sanasosa, Flo, Richard Jousey, DGE, John Kozura, Kevin Freehart, Marcelo Barnaba, Nick Tomlinson, Rafal Wojcik, Pedro Texera, Brian Terry, Danny, Denise Arnaud, Alexander Marius, Guy Jin, Andrew T. Douglas, Chris Hilly, Weller Tractor Salvage, Ranan Yechezkel, Ron Lyle, Frank, Pavel Zuzulski, Fraser Kane, Steve Schaber, Naked Bunny with a Whip, George Chiesa, Jason Bassanseni, Frederick Y. Martello, Steve Omohundro, Peter Williams, Bill Murphy, Mark Armstrong, Kevin Barnes, Patrick Dennis, Radek Nesbida, James Nance, Joe McFarland, Amir Asasnik, Rachel Merritt, Michael Mason, Sidney Atwood, Jose Enrique, Harry Plumley, John Methot, Nathan Hanna, Thomas All, Glenn McDavid, Benjamin Turner, David Taschioni, Joe Latone, Philip Radilovic, John Seal, Nathan Heston, Braxton Thomason, Karen Garrison, and Zarko Opacic. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Welcome to our first video edition of the Starts With a Bang podcast, and I'll see you back here next time for more Starts With a Bang.